Hello, greetings from your house shrink. Today I'm going to be talking about three rules that you need to know anytime you have adversity or chaos. Three rules. So if you have any questions as I'm going along with this, stop me and I will answer them for you. First, what is adversity? Adversity is something that interferes with your objective. You're wanting to go to school, you want to go to work, your car breaks down, well, that interrupts your objection, whatever objectives you have. So that's what it is. It could be a very terrible thing, or it could be a minor thing, but all the rules, these three rules apply to any condition. First, you have to ask yourself, what is it that I'm reacting to? You're reacting to some adversity, some chaotic situation, and ask yourself, am I feeling like this is moving too fast? Am I afraid? Or did I lose hope? Those are the three ingredients you need to look into. If the first one, it happens very fast, you feel like you're having to speed up, in all three of them, the first thing you do is you stop, you take a deep breath, and you allow the fight or flight response to come up, which is a stress and all that. Let it happen. Once it does, you breathe and you say, okay, one of the three tools that I need, which one? If things are moving too fast and it's speeding me up, then you have to find patience. You have to slow down. But how do you find it to create neural maps in your brain? You go back to times. So you have archives that are there from your ancestors and from yourself for hundreds of thousands of years. When was the last time that I was patient and things worked out for me? I was impatient, I slowed down, I was patient, and it started working for me. Then you go there, you bring it in, you embody it, and you slow down. Slow down. Don Quixote in uh, The Man of La Mancha, his uh, help or his uh, steward would help him put on his armor. And when he was rushing, he would say, dress me slowly, I'm in a hurry. So that's the first mantra that you learn. Dress me slowly, I'm in a hurry. When you're out of patience and there's chaos, if you speed up, the chaos gets worse because you're not paying attention. You're not tuning in and discerning. So that's the first thing. When it's coming too fast at you, patience is what you need to bring in. Second, something happens, chaotic, something adverse, and you feel very afraid. First thing you do, again, you allow the fight or flight, which is the expression of stress hormones. You have to allow them. You don't suppress them. After you allow them to happen, you breathe and you say, okay, now, if it's fear that I'm experiencing right now, then the tool is courage. How do I find courage? You go back to times in your life when you're courageous and it worked for you. Bring the memory back, embody it, feel it in your body and begin to act courageously. Now, courage is not being brave or the opposite of being a coward. Courage means that you have to give value to whatever you're doing, value to yourself or to whatever it is that you're dealing with. So for example, if you are somewhere uh, and you're on a boat and uh, a card falls into the water and you think that there may be sharks, you're not going to jump in for a, for a business card. But if it's your child or your brother or your sister or your family member, you jump in without thinking about it, not because you're brave, but because you gave value to what it is that, uh, that you're dealing with. So the terrain for courage is value. Value itself or the thing that you're working toward. But bring back the memory of when you were courageous. Embody it and all of that will come. And it will give you the tools that you need in order to be courageous about it. And the third is chaos comes in and is so overwhelming that you lose hope. You don't think anything's going to work out. You lose hope. There you go back to times when you had faith in something. Not necessarily religious. You can be religious if you want to, but it doesn't have to be religious. It has to be having faith in outcome. That in the past you had reasons to be faithful about something, to believe that something was going to get better. And then you bring it in, you embody it, and you begin to act as if you have the outcome already. So there the mantra is going to be, I believe in myself and in the outcome. But also the Buddhists have a saying about this. They call it, the storms will never outlast the mornings which means that the storm will always pass and the morning will not be outlasted. So those are the three components. Those are the three tools. If you feel it's moving too fast, slow down and bring patience in. If you're afraid, go 
go back and look at your archives of courage. When it worked for you, 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 the brain needs evidence. You just can't talk yourself into something. The brain needs evidence, as I teach here. And the evidence changes the neural maps of how you respond to things. Also, then, if you lose, if you lose your faith or you say, oh, this isn't going to work, I've lost hope, then bring times that you've had faith in yourself or in whatever it is that the outcome would be the best, the most auspicious. And the most auspicious means that it's the best condition in the long run. So those are the three tools. Anytime interrupt me and ask me questions and I'll help you deal with it. Actually, when you do this, your biological response changes from stress to curiosity. And curiosity has a different brain chemistry than stress. Stress causes disorganization of the brain. Sometimes you could be so stressed out that you can't even remember where you live. That's all right, that's disorganization. But what you do is you stop, you breathe, you bring in whatever tool you need for the condition, and then you begin to express it and you begin to live it. What will happen is that chaos will diminish in the amount of time and you will be more aware of what you need to do when other people are running around with their heads cut off, you're there doing what needs to be done. That's what leaders are all about. Leaders bring safety and equanimity when there's chaos all over the place. But you have to have the rules. You have to have rules that navigate. And uh, if you're trying to drive a nail with a screwdriver, it won't work as well as if you do it with a hammer. So you have to have the tools for the conditions. But also be aware that you were taught to deal with adversity by your culture. Some cultures will tell you hysterical because that's what you saw. Some cultures will say, repress it and don't feel anything because you were taught. Others will teach you, okay, equanimity. Let's see what we need to do here. So the context will tell you how you respond, but you can change the way you respond to a context. You go to a place and you uh, see something that reminds you of something that happened bad in your life and it comes back as if it were there. Because the memory remembers, the memory is stored with context. It has to have a context. Without a context, the memory can't be brought out. So be aware of that. Knowing that, then you can manipulate the way that you uh, memorize things and the way that you think bring back, the things that you bring back. So, okay, we have a lot of people here and uh, time for questions on navigating chaos, navigating adversity, the most difficult to the easiest, the three tools, patience, courage, faith. Have any situations that you've had that you want to talk about or any questions or comments, please feel free because remember, how shrink is here, so nothing to worry about. So let me know. Quite a few people here, but nobody's asking questions. What's going on? Don't be afraid. It's okay. Everyone has chaos. Everyone has conditions that require work. And here you are, an opportunity. Let's see, Robert came in. And uh, welcome. And there are quite a few other people here. So time for questions or comments. Don't be afraid. Joseph came in. Joseph, any questions? Andrea, any questions? Nobody's having questions, so I'll keep going. All right, remember, I'm going to go over it again because it's not an easy thing to remember. Jose just joined us. Chaos is an interruption of an objective. That's all it is, an interruption of an objective. It could be a car accident, a death, uh, um, you, your car breaks down. They all have the same processes. And they all require the same three tools that I'm talking about here. Patience, courage, faith. And you've already had patience. You already have a history of patience. You already have a history of courage. You already have a history of hope or faith. So what you do is you bring it in so the brain will know that, that it exists within you. That it's not something new. You're not navigating something crazy, but it's there. So you bring it in. And when you bring it in, it allows you to act with the consciousness of the memory, which is patience, courage, or hope, or faith. But remember, it's not a religious faith. If you have religion and faith is good for you, great. But this is a type of faith that I'm talking about, is that believe in the best outcome. Believe that you've been there before, and things have happened, and you have worked through them. 
That's the consciousness of faith. You have had patience in the back, that the consciousness of patience and the consciousness of courage. So find out which one it is that you need at the time. And then you act on it. You have three tools for chaos. That's how you navigate it. Hey, uh, Howdy is here. Hey, hello, welcome. Okay, questions. I'm sure that you've had some chaos in your life, some adversity, and you might have some questions. And uh, if you have questions, here I am. Anna Banana, hi, how are you? So all of you are here, quite a few of you are here, and uh, I'm still waiting for questions. And what will happen is when I finish, oh, I just remembered, I had a question I could have asked. How Shrink is here for you, totally for you. So go on and let me know what questions you have. Because remember, there's something called epigenetics that I'll explain to you. It was thought that we pass information only by genes and it takes hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years to change something. Now we know by the last 50 years, it was discovered there's something called epigenetics, which means beyond your genetics. And what's happening is you're passing on information that's not necessarily coming from your DNA. So you pass on information from one generation to another, wisdom as well as possibility to get sick. So for example, people that were in concentration camps in World War II, uh, Auschwitz and other concentration camps, they had a very high level of stress, of course, cortisol and epinephrine or epinephrine. For three generations, that level of cortisol is passed on epigenetically to the next two generations. So that's an epigenetic transfer. So what I'm saying is it could be bad, but it could be good because as Homo sapiens, we've been around for about 150,000 years and we pa we're passing on generation to generation all the skills that we need from the time of the caves and the forest to the times now in the corporate world. They're all the same. We're still tribal. So knowing that, you can sit, close your eyes, and ask for the information that you need. Do I need courage now? What is my history of courage? Do I need patience now? What is my history of patience? Do I need hope now or faith? What is my history? And what is my ancestral history? Information will come. This is really good science. This is good mind-body science that has been tested and, uh, and works really well. It definitely works very well for me. And this is why I teach it and in my books I talk about it. The Mind Body Code, The Mind Body Self, they're both bestsellers. And I also invite you to go to my YouTube channel because I have over 120, 130 videos there. All kinds of things, of course, free about topics on relationships, about uh, illnesses, how we learn the causes of health, many, many things. And it's simply Dr. Mario Martinez YouTube channel. Go there. And it's all available to you. Edge Life. Hello. Edge Life 48. How are you? More people coming in. More people coming in. And no questions. But I'll keep going. Go a little bit further. And I'll give... Sometimes it takes a while for people to come in and start asking questions and feel comfortable. These are questions that... The beauty of questions is when you ask a question, it's usually something that someone would want to ask, but they don't. So when you ask, it, they're grateful for your question because uh, now they get the value of it. And if they're shy, they say, okay, I'm glad that somebody was able to ask a question for me. Cowboy Nation, greetings. Any questions, please ask. They keep coming up, they keep coming up, which is good. It's nice. It's a, it's a popular channel. I think uh, what's happened is I've been only been up for about a month and it's been organic, or the reaction that people have had. So if you have not followed... Uh, please follow, uh, because that's what allows you to then have access to the things that I'm doing and finding out the latest uh, of what I do. So now I can do, for example, I can do now the uh, the live streams for about an hour because of the amount of uh, followers that I have. So it works really well. And, and I can offer quite a bit of psychological information. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, and I'm here to help in any way that I can. King King, how are you? I want to say hi to all of you. And if anybody has any question, Donna, Kate, Kathy, or Kathy Camara, welcome. People just bursting in. And I want to have a question before I go so you can take advantage of this 
many years of psychological training and working with people in all kinds of conditions and two books that are bestsellers explaining how all these things work. And here you are, my group joining me and able to ask any question you want. Okay, so uh, I'll do a little bit more, giving people a chance to come in. And it usually takes about 15, 20 minutes for some reason for people to come in. But we have time because I have up to 60 minutes. It's really nice. Okay, more on chaos. As I said, our culture teaches how to deal with chaos, how to deal with adversity, how to deal with uh, conditions that, that disrupt your life. And what you want to ask yourself is, how did my culture, and by my culture, I mean my parents, people who are important, my teachers, my friends, how did they teach me by observation, by watching how they deal with things? How did they teach me how to do things during adversity or chaos? What, what did I learn from them? And you don't, you're not aware, but you learned how to respond. It's not just an automatic response. This is a learned response to conditions of adversity. And you may have had a mother which is, was hysterical. She'd go all over the place when something happened. Or a mother that was very, very calm and was able to handle things and gave you a sense of safety. Because during chaos, the most important thing that you need is safety. And how do you get safety? By going inward and using the three tools that I talked about. The tool of patience, courage, and hope or faith, whichever way you want to call it. So this is what's going on. These are the three tools. And I'll be talking about many more subjects later, uh, relationships, how to develop healthy relationships, how to get away from relationships that are from people who are broken, who don't want to change, don't want to grow. Uh, that can be very chaotic too. Because you wake up in the morning and you don't know uh, where the thunder is going to come from. That's not a good way to live. To be able to have peace in your life, you have to have some predictability. Life is not predictable, but at least some of it should be predictable. And if you have a life of chaotic uh, uh, situations where you're constantly changing and constantly not knowing what to do, <clears throat> you need to take a look at that and see what's going on. Because it's not healthy. It's not good for your health. You age faster, and you don't live as long. Uh, let's see, a few other people coming in, and no questions. Wow, no questions. It's all right. If you don't have any questions, it means you're understanding everything, or you're, or you're shy. Either way, it's okay. <clears throat> Meanwhile, because later after I finish these uh, presentations, people write me and, and thank me, and it's just really very nice, uh, very very uh, courteous people thank me for what I'm doing. And so sometimes they wait and ask questions later. Mackenzie is here. Oh, Mackenzie's the queen. Okay. Hi, Mackenzie. How are you? Any questions? Danny. Danny's here. Wow. All kinds of people are coming in. And remember, questions about how to deal with chaos. For those of you who just joined me, there are three tools. Patience. Courage and faith or hope. And each of them, you go back to the times that you have actually experienced that. You have to, embodiment means that you bring in <clears throat> what actually has happened in your life so you can feel it. You just don't think it, you feel it. And that's how the brain begins to make changes with the neuro maps. So if you need patience, go back to times when you were patient. Bring it back, experience it, embody it. It's like a, a cloak of patience. And then it'll show you how to be patient, even in the middle of a storm. You'll, you'll have patience. And, for example, athletes are, are taught that uh, when, let's say, a football player, when this is the most chaotic, people are coming at you, that's when you're most calm, so you can see. If you go too fast, things go too fast. If you slow down, you can see things almost in slow motion if you do that. Because the brain pays more attention when you are able to focus your attention and you can't focus your attention when you're all over the place. It has to be when you go back and you see things in some kind of order that you can put them together. So that's how that works with chaos. Chaos cannot be dealt with immediately. It requires standing back, watching to see what's going on and looking at what needs to be done. You don't become overreactive. Let's see, why are people chaotic on holidays? <clears throat> That's a good question. 
because that's, a, that's, a, that's how they were taught to be. Your culture will, te- will tell you how to be. During holidays, do you go crazy and go all over the place? Or during holidays, do you bond with your family and you create a sense of belongingness and quietness and sharing with each other? But remember, the media <clears throat> and, and, and the mercantile wor- uh, world, the, 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 the people that are trying to sell you, they like that. They like to tell you, well, if you don't, for, for Christmas, you have to buy a watch or for, uh, you have the new car. And they, they make you crazy. So be aware of the media and be aware of the commercial pressure that's put on you. And then when you have a holiday, it's a holiday for you to share and to celebrate the tribe, not to go crazy all over the place. So if, if there's craziness around you, there's chaos around you, slow down. Because another thing that happens when you slow down you give people an opportunity to slow down. Sometimes when I was working at the hospital and there was a patient that was very anxious and sometimes even psychotic, the first thing that I do, I would slow down. I would speak to them slowly to give them a frame, like a safe harbor. So you have to do that. But that's a really good question uh, of, uh, let's see, Cindy asked that question. Holidays are what you make them, not uh, what you were told they are by observation. You're not told this is how it is. You just watch how it is. And we, we observational learning, as you know now from the uh, videos that I've done, observational learning is first, comes even before language. Before you have language, you observe as, a, as an infant. Then the language comes in. But observational language is very, very important how you learn. So ask yourself, what have I learned about holidays? What have I learned about chaos? And this is the kind of thing that you begin to then change the neural maps. Neural maps are patterns of uh, neurons firing at each other uh, and creating a belief system. So in order for you to understand something, you have neural maps that allow you to understand something. Knowing that, you can change your history. No matter what's happened to you in your life, you can change it. You're not your past. You are what you do with your present. No matter what's happened to you, you can change it because of neuroplasticity. Let's see now. Um, Marshall is here. Anki is here. Any more questions? That was a great question about the holidays and especially Memorial Day, the aware that's coming up. You can deal with it chaotically or you can deal with it with a celebration in a peaceful way. Let's see, hi, uh, Marshall. Nathan, a lot of good people here. Um, Tyler. All right, next question. Neuroplasticity, more please. Neuroplasticity means that the brain is adaptable. If you look at the brain as a computer, which is not, but just to give you an analogy, it's a type of computer that the software can modify the hardware. There's no computer that can do that. So for example, The hippocampus is a part of the brain that stores emotional memory and relationships of things around you. So taxi drivers in in San Francisco and uh, London and other places that don't have numbers, they have streets that are named. So you have to have tremendous memory. What happens is that the environment is forcing you to remember things more than other people. And guess what? Your hippocampus gets bigger because it'll adapt to whatever it needs. And what that means is that you can change brain chemistry and you can change brain form by the software that you play out. So that's what neuroplasticity is. And there's much more to it. I might do a, just one video on neuroplasticity, but that's basically the idea that we have tremendous ability to change. As a neuropsychologist, I worked with people who had brain damage. And for example, they lost one particular function of the brain and they can pick up another function to compensate for that because the brain has something that's called redundancy. It stores things all over the place so that in case you have trauma in one part of the brain, it's still stored somewhere else and it allows you then to compensate, unless it's something really, really big, or some kind of major trauma or stroke or something like that. But that's how that works. So it's good news. The neuroplasticity is good news. Okay, let's see. The neuroplasticity question, that was really great. All of the questions are great. I've never heard a dumb question. Questions come from people who want to know, want to learn, and people who want to learn are intelligent. The more questions you are, you ask, and the more mistakes you make, the more successful you're gonna be. I've worked with many, many 
leaders and people in major corporations, and they had made more mistakes than anybody else. That's how they learn. So mistakes are approximation to a goal. It's not something to be punished, but something to use to see how you can do it differently next time. No punishment with mistakes, only approximations. It's very important. Uh, no self, no self-worth. That's pretty good. Hey, hello, and uh, more questions. See, more people are, incredible amount of people coming in, and questions are beginning to come slowly. Let's see. How does neuroplasticity relate to PTSD? PTSD is a post-traumatic stress disorder. And what happens there is that the brain is very intelligent. Let's say you have a car accident and it's so traumatic that the brain can't handle it at that time. You can't handle it at that time. So it compresses everything to deal with it later. But the later doesn't come because you're afraid to think about it. So what the brain does is every once in a while you have an anxiety attack or you have a PTSD reaction uh, getting you to work through that. And one of the ways to deal with a neuroplasticity of post-traumatic stress disorder is there's some techniques called systematic desensitization. What they do is they, they get you into a deep level of relaxation and then they bring out a little small part of the situation that happened to you. So for example, if you had a car accident, uh, you go into that deep relaxation and you have the person think of about the day before the, they, they had the car accident and they can handle that. And then you kind of overwhelm that low level of anxiety uh, two hours before the accident, a little piece of the accident, gradually you desensitize the system and you're able to handle the stimulus that was causing these kinds of problems for you. So uh, um, PTSD is not cured by medication. It can help. It needs to be cured, it needs to be worked through by behavioral mind-body methods to truly get rid of the situation. Uh, getting over phobias. Well, phobias are, I've done a lot of work with phobias. Phobias are an over response to a condition. So for example, if you're afraid of uh, bugs, you see them as elephants, huge. So one of the things that you do with phobias is the same thing, systematic desensitization. There are many other techniques, but that's one of the easiest. You create a condition, let's say you're afraid of, uh, of height. And you imagine that, and you go from one to 10, you create a little scale from one to 10. One is that you're in the first floor. 10 is that you're on the 20th floor. So 10 is always much more anxiety producing. Nine is less, less, less. So what you do is you get yourself very relaxed. And when you get yourself very relaxed, then you bring in the image of, I am on the first floor. And it's not gonna be as bad as the 20th, there's a little bit of anxiety with a high level of, of uh, relaxation, uh, so it's a wave that overwhelms it. Once you practice that first floor a few times, sometimes it takes five times, 10 times, doesn't matter. Once you practice it without any anxiety, you go to number two, which would be the third, the second floor, the third floor. You, you have to make them gradual. You do this and it may take a few weeks, a few days, until you get to the 10th, without the anxiety, then you practice it in vivo, in actual life. You go to the first floor and you practice a technique, second floor, so you never do it in the real situation. You always do it in your head under deep relaxation. And it's better to do it with a professional because they can they can help you. But uh, if you want to try it on your own, try it. And if you need more help, then you can go to a professional. Uh, so that's how neuroplasticity relates. You have a, a, uh, a neuromap and neuro patterns that respond to the stimulus that caused the, the post-traumatic stress. And what you're doing here is you're changing, you're reducing this, uh, an area of the brain called the amygdala. And that's where the fear is. When you're very afraid, when they do a, 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 an MRI, a scan, you can see that the amygdala is very active. But when you go to the cortex, which is the things that we're doing now, the cortex begins to then reduce the overreaction of the amygdala. The amygdala begins to slow down and then you can deal with the stress a lot better because you're desensitizing it. So that's how, that's how it works. PTSD and phobias are very similar in how you can deal with them. Uh, so phobias can be treated. Phobias have a very, very good prognosis. You need professional help, but they have a very good prognosis with, uh, with the proper mind-body uh, psychology that, that you can use. So we're getting a lot of good questions now. Uh, a lot of interest in uh, neuroplasticity. Uh, the moose is here. Hey, moose, how you doing? Um, 
any more questions? This is really getting very interesting because now people are beginning to open up and get more comfortable. Uh, you don't have to uh, talk about anything private if you don't want to. You can just in general, you can ask questions and that way you can have your confidentiality. So the neuroplasticity has been an important uh, subject. So I'll talk about that sometime. I'll create a, a, a video just for that and for phobias too. I've done a lot of work with phobias and they're very treatable and they have great prognosis when you do it right. Face King, a lot of people here, incredible amount of people. That's great, really wonderful, very popular. So what are the questions? I've covered a hell of a lot here. You're becoming quite knowledgeable in good mind body psychology. <laughs> so uh, be kind to yourself and learn these things about you. That there's more in here, there's more than just shaking your body. There are a lot of good things that you can do. And what you want to do is um, is be able to, to learn as much as you can. Uh, what music are you playing? I'm playing Persian bamboo flute. Uh, that is very, very soothing. Actually, it's very relaxing. It can, it can increase your endorphins and serotonin, and it gives you a sense of peace. So music has an effect on, on the nervous system. So that's what I'm playing. It's a, it's a Persian uh, flute. It's called nay flute. If you ever want to play it, it's nay flute. So uh, Mariah, Cindy, Cindy, LOL. <laughs> what was funny? <laughs> okay. What else? So I'm playing that music and sometimes I'll light candles and burn some uh, incense. I have a, a video that I did, go back to it, where I invite you to my living room and I talk about uh, particular subjects as if you're in my living room. You were sitting right across. Another one I did when I had a meal and I did one today uh, at the place that I go. is my favorite restaurant. It's a Kurdish restaurant and that's where I wrote one of my books. I write my books at restaurants. I go there and then I just write. The owners are really nice. They let me just, they leave me alone. And and then I write all I want. So the, the Mind Body Self was written at, at uh, Margot's Cafe in Nashville, Tennessee, an award-winning chef. And the Mind Body Code was written where I did the video today at the House of Kebab. So uh, it's really a lot of fun to do that. It takes a while. I mean, one of the books took me about nine months uh, some I write at home too, but quite a bit I'm inspired when I'm when I'm uh, eating some meal. Meals are really good. When you eat meals in peace, not with your cell phone and not with television, when you eat meals in peace, it's a powerful cause of health. It triggers the causes of health. And sometime I'm going to do one particular video on the causes of health. Health has causes that were transferred epigenetically for over 150 to 200,000 years as homo sapiens. So uh, they're there. And what I do is I teach you how to trigger the causes of health and how to do anti-aging uh, and reversing of aging by the causes of health. It's how you live that uh, actually allows you to, to grow younger and stronger. So uh, Trey White, oh, Trey White Field, hi. And uh, Cindy, very nice, thank you. Okay, what are the questions? covered a lot of stuff here just kind of bombarding you but if you have specific areas that you like and the things that i talk about just uh comment or later you can put it on if you want it uh and i'll try to come up with the uh, kind of videos that are interesting to you so uh gray el woke gray el woke uh whoever that is hello and welcome I'm not i uh, hope i'm pronouncing things right so how Shrink is here to answer questions and to give you things that have meaning. TikTok could be a lot of fun and you could do all the things that you want and songs, but it's also an opportunity to really give good, good information for people to reduce their pain, for people to learn more about relationship, to get rid of idiots who ghost you. I do one on ghosting. Ghosting is one of the most stupid, cowardly, senseless act. If anybody will ghost you, go out and celebrate that you were ghosted by an idiot and you don't want to be around idiots. People without backbone, you don't want that. You want people who have the courage to let you know when they don't want something and even the courage to let you know when something is over. That's how you do it with elegance. You have to have elegance in your life. It's very good for your health and your immune system, by the way. And one of my specialties is how cultural beliefs 
affect the immune system. It's called psychoneurology. So our culture beliefs will affect our biology. And now we know why. The ways of, of, of understanding it. And there's been over 50 years of research it shows that that's how it works. Uh, let's see, uh, Kathy Sunshine. Hi, welcome. And um, again, someone asked about the music. I have in the background, I have a uh, Persian bamboo flute. It's called Ney flute. So if you want to look it up and, and find it and, and play some of it, it's a lot on YouTube. It's really very soothing, very relaxing, and, and just a kind of music that I like to hear when I'm trying to think and when I'm trying to write or when I'm trying to think about what to do here. Hi, Kathy Sunshine. Thomas, Thomas, welcome. All right, any other questions? I think we're coming to an end here. Uh, and I just want to know if you have any other questions to make sure that uh, you take advantage of this opportunity. There'll be many more. But make sure that if you haven't followed my work, follow it. Because that's what allows you to then stay in touch. And it allows me to be able to do more things here. This is totally free that I'm doing here. It's pro bono. Uh, to provide some of my expertise for those of you who feel like you can take advantage of it. So that's how it is. Okay, another new person here, Basa Nad Sejo, Sehu. Welcome. One more question. One more outlier, one more hero here. Question, please, so that you can help other people with your questions. Uh, Chrissy, hi Chrissy. Joseph, oh Joseph is back. Um, so, um, Uh, put on a mask, please. Why? Am I going to be infecting my iPhone? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh, Samantha Louise joined us. Very good. Put on a mask. Come on. Let's get over this. Uh, fear decreases immune, immune function and makes you more prone to the COVID-19. I'm not suggesting not to have a mask, but uh, don't get uh, hysterical. Be cautious. But don't be hysterical. I know you're joking, Joseph. It's okay. Um, I know you're joking. My iPhone said, you don't need to wear a mask. It's okay. We're fine here. So I know you were joking around. That's good. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? And I, I really want to tell everybody how happy I am to be here and how much I love uh, being able to share some of my knowledge. And uh, especially if you have questions. Let's see. Fear is the cause of illness and anxiety. No kidding. You're right, Cindy. Let me tell you why. Fear is a fight or flight response, which means that you either fight or you fly, you run. And that causes a cascade of hormones, uh, cortisol, norepinephrine, epinephrine. And what that does is suppresses the immune function. Why? Because at that moment, let's say you're eating, you're having dinner, uh, and you have a fight or flight, the system says, okay, you have to run or fight and we'll put the digestion away for a while and then later you bring it back. But you don't bring it back because you keep worrying. That's why you have stomach problems. So if you're in a chronic state of anxiety and fear, you're suppressing immune function. If you suppress immune function, then what happens? You don't have enough strength to fight illnesses. I'll give you an example how cultures teach it. Some cultures will say, don't go out in the rain, you'll catch a cold. And if you come from that culture, you go out in the rain, you catch a cold. Why? Because you're teaching the bio symbol of danger. You're saying rain, water, danger. So you're taught by somebody who has power in your life, what I call a culture editor. So that when you go out in the rain, the brain says danger, danger, secretes the cortisol. First, norepinephrine, epinephrine come out and then cortisol later. But then what it does, you're out in the rain, you're wet, you're cold. Your immune system is suppressed. You catch whatever's going out there. You come back home and your mom says, I told you you're going to catch a cold in the rain. Well, if you don't believe in it, go out in the rain. The only thing that's going to happen is you're going to get wet. That's it. So, uh, Cindy, that was a good question. And, and they do, they do, uh, uh, fear causes illness. Fearful people usually don't have as good a uh, health as other people. Uh, my mother told me the police were coming when uh, she heard a siren while driving. Well, 
what that tells you again is the bio symbol is that the police are an alarm. Some cultures will teach you to be afraid of the police. In some places, you have to be afraid of the police. But in general, there are a lot of good people that, that, are, that go into police uh, service to, to serve and to protect. But what you're taught by people, what I call the culture editors, culture editors are very powerful in your life. People that change your diapers are very, very powerful in your life. So pay, pay attention to that. Whatever they taught you, men are bad, women are bad, this is dangerous. That goes into your symbols, your bio symbols. And even though intellectually you say, no, no, that's not true. It's embedded and you have to change it. You have to do recontextualizing. Uh, very feared based person. Yeah, of course. And, and, and probably not in great health, I would imagine. Uh, because uh, because to be fearful, you're suppressing immune function. And if you suppress immune function, then you're, you're allowing pathogens to come in or you're allowing the genes that express illness to come out because there's no protection. The immune system is a protector, but you need to give it calmness to be able to, to protect you. You don't, you don't want to repress emotions. You want to express your emotion, but you don't want to rerun things that happen to you. And an example that I always use that I want you to consider is that cultures love to out-victimize you. So and the example that I use is you're driving and some idiot gets in front of you without signal and almost causes an accident. And you go, oh my God. Well, you're having a stress reaction, which is okay. So what you do is you stop, breathe, and say, this is a signal for me to now turn on my radio and have some good music and relax. But you don't get to work or to school or whatever and talk about it. Guess what happened to me? You don't do that because then you're rerunning and your brain brings out the cortisol again. And somebody will, will out-victimize you. will say, um, oh, really? You got Somebody got in front of me? Well, yesterday, three people got in front of me. And then you get into the, into the, uh, the victimhood. And that's not good. So what I do, anybody gets in front of me or whatever, I breathe. I turn on the radio. I do some relaxation. When I get to wherever I'm getting to, I don't talk about it. I let it go. I breathe and I smile in the control that I'm learning so that I don't invite people into victimhood with me. Hi, I'm from Virginia. How are you? I'm doing great. I am in Tennessee. Peachy Bowler, Virginia, pretty state. And uh, can you tell me some of you where you're from? Let's see. Music always calms you. Yes, music is very calming. Now, rap is not going to calm you because of the content and the beat. It goes counter, counter heart, counter heartbeat. Nothing against rap. It's just what it does psychologically. It doesn't relax you. Oregon, Kentucky. Oh, that's great. One of the best music is Gregorian chanting. Actually, Gregorian chanting music when a woman is pregnant and she plays music for the fetus, it's been shown that the probability of that child when they're born of being good with math and being good with abstract things increases. So look at the power even in, in, in the uterus, how things can change. But you gotta listen to the right music. You don't wanna listen to music that's talking about rape and talking about beating, that's not, that's not good music. You wanna listen to it, it's fine, but it's not gonna do you any good. Okay, where else are you from? Who's, let's see who's here from the farthest place from Nashville. We got Oregon so far as the farthest. We got Kentucky that's next door, right above. Where else are you people, people from? The other day I had somebody from Poland and somebody from New Zealand. Let's see, yes, I don't really find rap to come. I like country music personally because it really is, it really is as far as, uh, it stops there. Well. You have to, if you like rap, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. But don't use it to meditate because it's not going to help you. It's just, it doesn't work that way. Uh, yeah, okay, it's pertaining to your life. Yeah, whatever music you like is, is, is great. I, love all, I like all kinds of music. And even some rap is great, but not to relax. One thing is to keep you excited or whatever, and the other one is to relax. So you have to use the right tools for the right reaction that you're wanting. So uh, where else, uh, tell me some, one of you, where are you from? Far, far away, where are you from? A lot of people here, and now they're beginning to come out slowly and telling me where they're from. 
had New Zealand, China, Poland uh, on the last uh, one that I did. So it's really great. It's really great to have you here. Um, Kentucky Great Bourbon. Very good. So, um, in, of course, in, in Nashville. Uh, oh, reggae. Yeah, reggae is very nice, too. Reggae is really very nice. <clears throat> it's got a really good beat. And, uh, and it's got some, some, some of it is really, really good. I think it's, it's wonderful. Uh, all music, all music is good. It just depends on how you want to use it and the reaction that you're going to have to it. Even Mozart could be uh, stressful, depending on what you're listening to. Or uh, Beethoven could be stressful. But there's also some classical music that will put you into a, what's called a, a theta wave, which is really, really deep waves. Uh, sipping on a little whiskey. Love the steel drums. Great. What kind of whiskey are you, uh, are you sipping here? I love uh, scotch. I have bourbon every once in a while, but this, I'll tell you, my favorite sc uh, scotch whiskey is Lavagulan. It's from Scotland, of course, and it's from an island off Scotland. And Lavagulan in, in Scottish really means the distillery at the end of the meadow. Pretty nice. It's really kind of peaty. Very nice. Uh, but if you're, if you're underage, can't drink. I'm talking about people that can drink. If you can drink, good whiskey. Good wine. I love good wine, too. Uh, tea carts have whiskey on them. Tea carts? They do? Well, explain, Cindy, what's going on here. Uh, Cly Polly, welcome. So where are you from? So far, Oregon has been the, the farthest away from where I am. So can somebody beat that? No, nope, somebody will say Russia just to, to win. <laughs> so tell me. Yes, water, tea, and whiskey. Okay, great. In that order? Um, whiskey is actually very, uh, very soothing, very relaxing. It's very good for. It's actually better than than beer, if you can drink. Of course, I don't suggest that anybody who's a minor would drink. But if you are of uh, drinking age, then uh, I think whiskey, especially good whiskey, is really very good. Aberlauer is another very good whiskey. Um, Macallan Twenty Five, extremely expensive but very good. But if you if you don't drink whiskey or if you're underage, you can have tea. You can have anything. It doesn't have to be. Uh, Alcohol. It's the, the the ritual that you create. Sometimes I have a ritual just with hot tea, and it's just as good as whether I'm drinking wine. My heritage. I am 49% Irish, and the other is mostly Scandinavian. Okay, good. So you have a little Irish and a little um, um, Nordic uh, Vikings. So hardy people. Uh, let's see. Louis Skew is great with chamomile tea from Kentucky here. Okay, very good. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but uh, that's the way that it was spelled. Uh, anybody else? What is your favorite drink? Doesn't have to be alcoholic. And where are you from? Clyde Polly, joined again. Whiskey is your favorite, Cindy. Okay, good. All right, so I hope that uh, you were able to enjoy this and getting back into what I was talking about of how to navigate chaos with the three rules. Uh, I love a good hot toddy with cinnamon and lemon water. Oh yeah, that's really good. Yeah, great, great stuff. Uh, cinnamon is actually very good for you. It's an anti-inflammatory uh, and an antioxidant. So cinnamon, try cinnamon with uh, yogurt sometimes and it's just delicious. It's like ice cream, but healthier and not, not as fattening. So the three components, the three tools, for adversity, for chaos, patience, courage, and faith. My favorite is ginger tea. Ginger is really good. I, I love ginger tea. I drink it in the morning and it's very soothing for a stomach. Anytime you have a little bit of a stomach ache or a, a stomach that's a little unsettled, ginger is very good for it. Oh, of course, with whiskey. I don't know. Never had ginger with whiskey, but uh, I would imagine that it's okay. <laughs> um... Ginger root, yeah, ginger root's really good. It, and it's very healthy, actually, very good. I love that, and for, for cooking also, it's very good. Um, I made uh, uh, some um, moon, uh, moon bean uh, with uh, curry last night, and I used uh, a lot of ginger. Good for inflammation, yes, it's, it's an anti-inflammatory. That's right, for arthritis and, uh, and for fibromyalgia, 
MS, all the inflammatory autoimmunes. I go with uh, gingerate. All right, that sounds really good. So any other questions on chaos, how to deal with chaos? You don't want to use whiskey to deal with chaos. You want to use the three tools <laughs> that I gave you. So make sure that you use the right tools. Anybody else want to tell me where you're from? To see who is anybody further than Oregon? Uh, yes, I'm a, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. My, my doctorate is in, in clinical psychology. And I practice uh, neuropsychology. And I work with autoimmune illnesses and uh, anxieties. And, but especially how cultures affect the immune system. That's my specialty. And if you go to my, uh, as I mentioned earlier, YouTube, just go to Dr. Mario Martinez YouTube channel. And I have hundreds of uh, both uh, audio and, and videos about many of the topics that I talk about here. So uh, just uh, I invite you to go there. And if you haven't followed my work, follow here and follow at uh, YouTube. I have uh, over a, a half a million views already on, on YouTube. So it's really a very popular channel because I have a lot of good stuff. So you have to be comfortable with yourself. Don't be pseudo humble. When somebody says something good about you, just, yeah, you're right. Thank you. They say, hey, you're very bright. Thank you. I'm glad you noticed that. Don't worry about people thinking you're conceited. It's a gift when someone tells you something nice about you. Learn to accept it. Okay. Anybody else? God bless you. Uh, I used to go to a lot of psychologists. All they would do is prescribe me pills. Well, some of them, that's all they can do. Sometimes you need medication. But in many cases, what you need is a recontextualizing of what's going on in your life and looking at, uh, and looking at how you learn things in your life. Uh, thank you for your pro bono work. You're, uh, you're welcome. If you want to make any contributions, for, uh, I'll, I'll use it for something else, but, but basically this is pro bono. I don't charge for anything. Eh? Uh, so glad I'm not taking meds and now feel so much better. Well, good for you. Always remember, I'm not trying to get you to not go to doctors or not to follow your doctor's advice. Very important to follow your doctor's advice. But as a consumer, you have a right to ask questions and you have a right to get legitimate answers. And if you don't like what they tell you, you can go to another doctor. That's what a consumer is all about. You have to have doctors that are willing to work with you, not who tell you what you should do as if you're some kind of idiot. You're not. Okay, very good. Uh, Peachy Bowler, now I understand, or now I understand. I'm not sure what I'm at here. Okay, we're getting close to the end. I don't know how much more time we have. Uh, I'm the head of, uh, of the care plan. Yes, you are. So what are your feelings on vaccine? Well, a vaccine is a very personal thing. If you believe that you uh, need to have the vaccine, do it. If you don't believe it, don't do it, but be very cautious. So I'm not saying one way or the other. That's a very personal decision that you make with you and your doctor and go from there. But what I do know is that it looks like the pandemic is coming down. There's something called herd immunity, which is that enough people get the virus that they develop antibodies and they have immunity. It's called herd immunity. Between that and the, uh, and the vaccines, it's gone down. But viruses have, a, they have a, a cycle. They go up and they last a certain amount of time. And of course, you have to do prevention. It's very important to do prevention. But they have a, they have a life of its own. And then after the herd immunity and the vaccines and the weather, uh, the hot weather is goes uh, against uh, the viruses, then it begins to drop and, and the death begins to go up. But the thing about the COVID is that 90% of the people that have died have had some other comorbidity, other types of illnesses. So you don't know if it was the, the virus helped the illness uh, um, get worse or the other way around. So many of them, uh, people that are, don't have any, any comorbidity, 99% of them have been able to overcome it. Some of them have overcome it without any, uh, without any symptoms. But again, I think that vaccine is a very personal decision that you make with your doctor. And that's what I suggest. Uh, immune system will fight it off. That's why I have it. Uh, well, sometimes it'll, it'll, what will happen is that if, if you have it, some people have very, uh, they're asymptomatic. They have no symptoms. 
and some people have really, really bad symptoms. Now, the vaccine doesn't prevent you from, from getting it. What it does is it, it, it prevents the, the death or it prevents the, the intensity, and it also doesn't prevent you from passing it on. So uh, uh, the vaccine is very helpful, but it's not just completely uh, uh, something that's completely 100%. And you also have to look at the side effects. We don't know what the side effects are because these were passed on from nine months of, uh, of, of clinical uh, trials, and we don't know what the long-term effects are. So again, it's a decision that you make with your doctor, and whatever you decide with your doctor is what's right for you. So I don't go one way or the other. I'm just giving you some facts, and uh, then you decide what you need to do because you're, you know your body better than anybody else. Your doctor knows your physiology but you know your phenomenology better than anybody else. So you have to work with a doctor that works with you. And if your doctor thinks that you need it, then take much uh, care because that your doctor is saying, is saying to you that, uh, that you need it, so pay attention. Like your painting, can you tell me about them? Okay, this painting, I'm, I'm an artist also. I'm a, I'm a, a surrealist artist. This painting is called um, The Betrayal of Samson. And uh, I don't know if you can see that uh, there's a figure there and you can see that it's Samson. And then there's a hand cutting his hair, which is the slave that uh, is cutting his hair. Uh, Delilah was, that's, uh, that's, she betrayed him and he lost his strength. So that's a, an oil on paper that I did. And if you go to my website, uh, biocognitive.com I have a gallery there and you'll see all of my um, surrealistic work so you can go there and enjoy it uh, thank you nice love it um, you love to paint paint is a great uh, therapy and it's a wonderful thing I've been painting for, for quite a while before I went into psychology I went to art school in France so uh, I'm a uh, clinical psychologist and a, and a uh, surrealist painter I like Dali I like Picasso Amadeo uh, uh, Modigliani and many others. And so it's a combination of things that I do. And sometime I'll do a, a video on my work. I'll go around and show you some of my paintings and, and, and describe them because they have a neuropsychology the way that I do it. Okay, any more questions? I think we're about ready to finish here. So if you have any other questions or comments, let me know. And I will try to answer them as much as, uh, as, much as I can. But if not... Remember, we're ending with what I started, the three tools for chaos and adversity, patience, courage, hope. And you have to bring them from your history, embody them and live them out and practice them throughout the day. Okay, so now enjoy and I will be seeing you very soon and your house shrink is saying adios, enjoy. And all of you are beautiful, intelligent, wonderful people. Thank you.